Welcome back to the Homeschool Advantage podcast. I'm your host, Bex Buzzy. And today we're talking about set me free and I can learn. With us, we have Rachel Tidd, CEO and founder of discoverwildlearning.com. She's a former elementary and special education school teacher, now homeschooler and a CEO. She's also the author of Wild Math and Wild Reading Curriculums. Rachel shares in this podcast something very intimate, that her son was a sensory seeker, and at home he just could not get that met. But she learned that in forestry school, when she mentioned it to them, they had no idea what she was talking about because he did not have that issue there. He was getting all his sensory needs met outdoors. Taking what she had learned and what others would have seen as a problem, she turned it into her superpower and found a way not only to help her son, but thousands of other kids too. Go grab your coffee, go grab your tea, pen and paper, because you're going to want to take notes. And let's get into the podcast. Say hello to the listeners and... Rachel, tell us one misconception that most people have about homeschooling. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, Let's see. One misconception I would have to say um, is how much time it takes. So um, most people imagine homeschooling is that you're sitting at a table all day long from the school hours of nine to three. Um, And that's not really what it needs to look like. Some people might do that, but um, the reality is that you can usually do your work in an hour or two, like book work type things. Um, There's a ton of flexibility in how you do that. You don't have to do book work at all if you and your child uh, don't want to do that. Um, And um, we're barely ever home. So that table idea (laughs) doesn't really exist. Um, My kids are in classes, they're in full day programs. In some cases, they're in book clubs. Um, I do more driving than (laughs) (laughs) I would say most um, parents do, although maybe with after school activities, but it's, it's kind of like that where you're they're going to this and they're going to that. And then they're going to this park day with a whole bunch of friends and you know, they're spending all day out in forest school and doing all kinds of things like that. Well, first misconception is on how you learn subjects like math. A doesn't need to be in the house or even reading. Doesn't need to be sitting down the whole time and you can get it done within an hour. And another thing is how and why it's so important to understand the focus of a curriculum. And you guys are doing awesome right now by listening to this podcast for that. And then understanding that learning is not just about rote memorization, but comprehension and application. And another thing is how to take more of the learning outdoors, which adds more for that multi-sensory learning aspect that kids really need. I mean, you hear Rachel, she is in her car most time taking her kids everywhere. That's a really full, robust life. So Rachel, talk to us about how your curriculum approaches these learning differences. Yeah, so um, I wrote Wild Math and Wild Reading, and there are two curriculums that take um, regular academic skills that you would learn in any classroom, but we try to do them outside, and they're often very like nature-based or using natural materials. So for Wild Math, Um, Instead of plastic manipulatives, we're using rocks and acorns. We use a lot of chalk on outdoor surfaces. Um, We'd use 10 frames and 100 charts like you see in a classroom, but we have um, big, big cloth uh, 100 charts or 10 frames and we're putting natural materials on them. Um, Everything's super hands-on. There are no worksheets. There are worksheets in reading, but it's more like to record things, to get kids writing more, or they're searching for things outside or they're researching plants, et cetera. Um, So it's not like worksheets in the traditional sense. Um, And there's a lot of games um, and I have a list of books and games for every unit. 
So um, I'm kind of hitting it in different ways. Um, but yeah, it's super hands-on. It's really good for kids that need to move. You know, as soon as you go outside, the rules kind of change. Um, you can be louder, <laughs> you can move more. It just like what's acceptable changes. Um, so that can be really helpful to our movers and our shakers. Um, and the mental health benefits too of, you know, um, our mental health, but also um, engagement goes up. Um, stuff yeah, like that, so. that whole like discovery mode uh, just literally goes up to another level. So this is one question I just thought of too. So a lot of your stuff is outdoors, hands-on learning. Is there a way that maybe parents could also like, let's say that they live in the city, right? Is there a way that they can apply those same types of outdoorsy things to maybe their city life and bring their kids out? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, you know, it, it, I often say about my curriculums because I have pictures about where I live. Um, but I also get like people being like, well, I live in the desert, you know, and I don't have acorns or whatever. I'm like, well, use what's local to you. Um, I actually student taught in New York City. So, and I taught there for a few years oh, wow. and there are plenty of places, you know, nature is everywhere. If you start looking and that can be kind of fun for kids to look for, you know, in our pocket parks, um, in our more planted gardens, in um, botanical gardens, in zoos, you can get a lot out of zoos. And it, there's a lot of math in zoos when you start like thinking about like how many animals, how big is it? How much food do they eat? How many pounds, you know? Um, how large are these animals? You could just kind of have to think out of the box a little bit, um, but there's a ton of nature. The trees, urban trees are super diverse and super interesting. Um, New York City has all kinds of like ginkgo trees and like it has a really wide variety. And sometimes you can hook up with the like um, cities and larger, like smaller cities and big cities have like a urban forester. I mean, ours gave, gave us a tour of like the trees <laughs> with our book club because they read a book about trees. Um, and it was like fascinating. And they like track all the trees in the whole city. So there is a ton that you can do in the city. And then you can also collect natural materials and bring them home to use, maybe not outside in the woods like I do, but um, you know, in your apartment, on your stoop, and then I always, always recommend sidewalk chalk because yes. you can do that on the wall. You can do it on the sidewalk. You can do it on the stoop. You can do it in the park. You can do it on the basketball. You know, a lot of um, playgrounds have that like, I don't know, it's like spongy. You can yeah. draw on that too. So yeah. um, there's a lot you can do with chalk. I'm actually I, writing a book coming up and there's a whole chapter on the wonders of chalk. Really? <laughs> yes. Can you share with us a little bit of a, like one wonder of chalk? <laughs> well, it's just like one of these materials that it's cheap, it's easy to use, it's available and anyone can really utilize it no matter where you live. So it's a good example for urban environment. You can use chalk, you know, to play games, to write, to make those 10, 10 frames, to make a hundreds chart. Um, but you can also, we use it on rocks <laughs> outside in the forest. I have pictures of my kids doing math and sight words on boulders or on slate. Um, we don't have a paved driveway or a paved anything. <laughs> so my kids write on the porch or on the, we live in a log house, so they write on the logs. Um, so it's really adaptable. So it's kind of amazing material that you can really use it anywhere. So yeah, I'm writing a book for educators and that's like one of the main first chapters because I'm trying to make it, you know, the things that teachers can do anywhere outside. I love that because you're taking, taking the school anywhere and you can have a blackboard type anywhere. Right. I love that. That really takes, that is so outside the box of thinking. I, you know, and I love what you said about um, 
you don't have to be living in, you know, in the woods or in a forest. You can take, even if you're a, a beach bum, right? Like there's seashells, there are, you know, so many different things. You can use sand for weight and do scales. There's yes. just so much you can do. Water, counting the water species in there. Maybe you have a little mic, a little, you know, to go into biology, you know, and yes, seaweed. And even New York City, you can take the uh, train to the beach. So yes. <laughs> There's so much. And and I like that. You know why? Because um, I think sometimes we're so caught up with just what we see that we stop actually using our brains to think outside the box. I know sometimes, you know, that those critical thinking skills and that, that actually takes critical thinking skills to be able to say, well, I can use a boulder for my you know, for my blackboard. Uh, and right. it, it sounds like it's not, but it is because you're thinking outside of what the norm is and you're applying what you're learning anywhere which is so diverse and it would make help children literally be able to be very adaptable on a whim that's amazing <laughs> what was your inspiration for this because this i when I was looking through your website and i'm really thankful that you came on the podcast to talk to us about it like where did all this inspiration come from because it's beautiful i love what i read can you share with us like where all that came from sure so um it was basically my youngest son so i have two boys they're 12 and 9 right now um but when i started this um my youngest was three or four and um he was in a forest preschool which is an all outdoor preschool um they have an indoor space they can go if it's like a thunderstorm or something but they are outside the entire time they're there um and we live in upstate new york so it's cold and snowy so if you're thinking oh i live in i don't know florida or something that's not true um <laughs> but he was thriving in forest preschool and both of my kids went to this preschool um, and thrived for different reasons. But my youngest one um, at home was, had a lot of sensory needs um, and was driving us up on the wall, up the wall because he is like a sensory seeker. Um, and we had like swings and crash pads and all kinds of things in our home, but it was still driving us nuts. Um, and so to have it, it sounds horrible, oh, <laughs> but yeah. it's true. And I'm sure many parents can sympathize. I was going to um, say. <laughs> so um, I went to have him evaluated and um, I brought his teachers, you know, the, the scales that they have to fill out. And they were, they just like looked at me and they're like, what do you mean sensory needs? We don't have any issues with him here. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I'm a special educator. Like I'm having difficulty at home, although it is always harder with your own child, but, um, and it really got me thinking and we talked a lot about it during his evaluation and the OT really felt that the forest preschool outdoor environment was meeting all of his sensory needs. And that really got me thinking, um, about a lot of things like, okay, if this is, this is a great environment for him, great. But however, he is going to age out of this environment in another year. Um, and then I need to somehow um, teach this child academic skills. And um, we were already homeschooling my oldest. So he kind of lucked out in that regard, but I knew to be successful that I was going to need to at least integrate some of these of this like outdoor environment, you know, to really meet his needs so that he could learn. Um, and so when I went to look for things, <laughs> I found lots of science and I found lots of, you know, awesome play-based stuff. I'm really into play-based learning, absolutely. Um, but there was nothing, you know, I'm a teacher. I was a public school teacher and not that I homeschool in this way, but I really believe in basic skills. Um, and I knew my child was going to need a lot of explicit instruction in this area. Um, he does have dyslexia. We didn't know it then. Um, uh, and he has dyscalculia. So I, you know, and those were things we found after, but you could see that like things needed to be a little different for him. Um, but there was just nothing out there. There was nothing. I mean, there's a little bit, 
a few fun ideas, a game, but there was nothing that like brought you through all of kindergarten math or, you know, of how to teach a child to read in phonics. There was just nothing there. And so I just started experimenting and then um, in doing stuff with my kids. And um, I had a friend that said, you need to write this down. I was like, no, 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 no one wants to see what I'm doing here. And then she's like, and she wouldn't give up. And I'm really thankful that she kept saying it. Um, and I did, and I put it out there and then it slowly grew. And then it just really took off. And a lot of people seem to have kids like mine and um it's help it's you know it's helpful to have a guide so totally. it's kind of pulling everything together for people you know yeah that's I love it I love that and you know your story isn't um much different than a lot of content um curriculum uh creators you all have a child or knew of some child that you were able to actually have as you like your your muse or avatar that you were going to work towards and it just happened to be that it benefited so many other parents and i i so strongly believe in that we're all given gifts and we should use our gifts and i find that through homeschool kids are able to learn basic skills like you said but alternative ways and they're able to now become exactly who they are. Now, when they enter into society, they have a whole different skill set that they're going to implement into this world that's going to make it so much more richer and right, right. be able to, you know, it's like it's like those things like um. I think of Albert Einstein who had like, you know, learning difficulties, but he changed the world, you know, when it came down to certain sciences. And I, I personally, and I tell all my, I'm a public school teacher still, and I tell my students every day, like you being born changed the world forever. Now you just have to go forth and become the best at whatever you are because someone needs you someone needs what you have it's like someone needed what you have right so thank goodness that your friend rachel did not stop a publisher talked to me and we talked about some ideas and now there you um, go they said you know i i was they wanted a book for educators about outdoor learning and things like that. And I was really adamant that I wanted to write a practical book for teachers because I did not want to, I, as a teacher, I, you don't have time. You just want like practical ideas that you can put into your classroom. And um, I mean, it's a book really anybody that's, I mean, homeschoolers could use it too. It's not like specific. It's just the language is like students and classroom. Um, but yeah, so, and I really wanted to show how, like, they could, anybody can do it. Like, you don't have to have, there's a lot of amazing schools out there that some of them use my curriculum. They have, like, these amazing, you know, 40 acres and, like, these, like, lovely in school and outdoor classrooms. And But that's not the reality for most people. Um, and so I wanted to show how, like, the regular anybody anywhere could just do this. And so I really focused on in the schoolyard and that's where the chalk section is in the schoolyard games things you can do with chalk etc um in the neighborhood because there's a lot you can do in the neighborhood you so you expand that sphere out and then you know the most planning which is what most people think of is like a big field trip or like a bigger thing to like a natural area or a park that's like farther afield and then there's also a chapter about how to bring nature into your classroom and your routines like your morning meeting so wow you I'm working you, on it you're so very you're so very like expand but you're not just for homeschool you can apply to public schools and probably private schools and probably um charter schools like that I think that is really amazing. So one of the testimonies that I found, I love the smile on my son's face when he gets to do math outside instead of crouched over a workbook at eight years old. This could only have happened after I found wild math because before that he was miserable. And my smart little wild guy told me that he hated math. And now he's ecstatic. Uh, that is awesome. 
I love oh, yeah. hearing when they say I hated the subject and now they love it. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of parents are kind of um, scarred by the pandemic experience of so-called homeschooling. That wasn't really homeschooling. That was hard for everyone, even us homeschoolers, because yeah. we weren't home either. And then we were suddenly home um, and you were sent you know, you were doing Zoom and so were we, honestly, um, and a lot more worksheets and stuff, you know, you were being forced to kind of plow through with children and it's awful. It's a slog. It's not pleasant for anyone. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a few kids out there that like workbooks and that's fine. And that's, you know, they can continue to do them. But for the majority of students, you know, a work page workbook page maybe once in a while but it's really not and we know it's not the ideal way to learn um so I love when I hear that parents were able to use my curriculum and and teach their children in a different way and I love what you just finished saying that um people were kind of throw the unexpected homeschool they were thrown into homeschooling over the pandemic which is actually not the really not the proper in homeschooling is i'm so glad you said that because i think a lot of parents probably have got a little bit of trauma i'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie right traumatized because of what happened there they could potentially be missing out on the beauty and the 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 fullness of what homeschooling really could be Right. It's really nothing like what any of us went through. Um, certainly not what um, public school um, parents were going through because you just, you won't, you don't sit online all day. Um, you're not, you don't have to force feed lessons that you don't think they need to be doing. Um, you get to choose everything. You can choose what they learn, when they learn it and how they learn it um, and whether they learn it at all. So. Um, it's really a different experience and it becomes more, it's more of a culture in your home of learning as opposed to like, let's sit down and do school. You know, like I never really say, now we're going to do reading. Like my kids just read books because they wanna read books. And I don't say when, I mean, they just, they just do it. They have more, you know, time to do that. And it's part of our home culture that everyone likes reading or even being read to, um, you know, so it's kind of like ingrained in our home culture as a, like opposed to like a set subject. That's fantastic. That <laughs> totally does make sense. You built a culture within your family, within another culture. I yeah. think that is amazing. It's like a classroom culture, right? But it's, home. it's a learning culture. You yes, learning culture. Yeah, you built an edu you built a, a culture of learning, of loving of learning, and you built a culture that says you can learn anywhere, you're not stuck in one place, that right. life is learning. And truthfully, that is the best learning lesson for all kids to understand that learning doesn't stop because of a classroom or even start because of a classroom. Right learning is everything that we do. And that needs to come back into education where we don't allow schooling, like Mark Twain says, never let schooling get in, way with, get in the way with education. That to me has been so, you know, very dear to my heart. So as we're wrapping up, why don't, tell us where they can, you know, tell us where, where we can find you and what will they find on, you know, on your website and things like that. Sure. So my website is discoverwildlearning.com. Um, and you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Discover Wild Learning. And um, you'll find all of my curriculums on the website and information and example pages. And um, I post about all our homeschool adventures and <laughs> misadventures, I don't know, um, and a lot of nature things that we do on um, my social media and um, my new book wild learning will be out in spring of 2023 april 2023 so. yay yeah. so rachel is there one thing you want our listeners to take away from this conversation today um 
I think that, you know, learning can look really different and you can tailor it to your individual child, whether they go to school, you can help them after school in the way that they learn if you need to, um, and not to be afraid to make big changes if that's what you need to do. Um, you're always in charge of your child's education, no matter if they go to school or if you homeschool them, you, you are still in charge. Um, and it's still your responsibility. It's, it's, it kind of sounds mean, but oh, um, a lot of people are like, I'm just going to send my kid to school and, and they can do it, but it's still your responsibility as a parent. So um, it's, you know, <laughs> I love that. No, I love that. That was, that was perfect. It's your responsibility and it's your choice, whether they're going to learn it or not. Right. No one can dictate those two aspects to you awesome. and no one cares about your child as much as you do i mean teachers i love teachers we're both teachers and we care about our students but no one cares about your child as much as you as the parent does so you know the amount of effort and moving mountains that you are willing to do for your child you know um, goes a real long way so i love it thank you so much rachel thank you for sharing oh just your expertise, your knowledge, and just your passion, um, and how you've built and come through this uh, curriculum and everything, and where you're going now. Thank you so much. I appreciate it's so it. so great to be on. You've been listening to the Homeschool Advantage podcast, where you get the scoop on all the latest vendors that fit your lifestyle. Thanks for listening. Also, follow me wherever you listen to your podcast to stay up to date on the next episode. You can also visit my website where the episodes will be and for my free lesson plan course, which can help you if you have different vendors and you're wondering, how do I make them all flow together? Let me help you with that. And if you're a vendor and you think you would like to be on the podcast, send me an email realedtalk at gmail.com. Leave me your name, contact, website, and I'll get back to you. Thanks for stopping in with me and I'll see you on the next time.